It's August 7th, 1947, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. A boat made of balsa wood is something most of us would probably happily play with, sailing it around some local lake or pond, but few of us, I suspect, would feel comfortable getting on a raft completely made of balsa and sailing for three months from Peru to French Polynesia, as did the adventurer and amateur ethnographer Tor Heyerdahl, who, in the name of some racially controversial and altogether pretty pseudoscientific hypotheses, crashed his makeshift craft into a reef in the Tuamoto Islands today in history in 1947. And even though he crashed, that actually was a victory because it wasn't actually possible to steer the boat and crashing was the only way that they could actually come to a halt. And they had glimpsed land a couple (laughs) of times and sort of looked longingly at it, but they couldn't reach it because of the nature of the boat. Yes, this was the Contiki expedition, um, which is very famous, although I hadn't heard of it. I thought it was the 1999 single by another level. But what Heyerdahl wanted to prove was he believed that prehistoric Peruvians colonised the Polynesian islands by drifting on ocean currents. He believed that despite the fact that the people of Polynesia looked Southeast Asian and had an oral tradition together which suggested that that is anthropologically from whence they all originated, he thought the theory was wrong And actually, it was South Americans that had gone to the Polynesian islands and they'd done it on a balsa wood raft. So guess what? I'm going to prove that that's the case by doing it myself. I mean, it's mad. I enjoy that bit in legal dramas where the renegade plays by his own rules prosecutor, (laughs) decamps the entire jury to go to a woodland to retrace the steps of a murderer and show how it could be done. It's basically that, but for anthropology rather than crime. Yeah, but also for really poor (laughs) anthropology, because his ideas really were trying to progress this thing called Eurocentric hyperdiffusionism, which was this belief among Westerners that basically non-white so-called Stone Age societies, which in their view were lacking in any sort of mathematical knowledge or other skills, were basically incapable of colonising distant islands that were separated by vast expanses of ocean, especially against prevailing winds and currents. It was this idea that was called the Aryan Polynesian Hypothesis, which basically suggested that Polynesians actually descended from Europeans via this very circuitous route. And he was saying they couldn't possibly be anything other than us because they were exhibiting all of these great seafaring skills. Yeah, I mean, if you're thinking, well, South Americans aren't European, so how would the settlers coming from Peru fit into that theory? There were also these Incan legends about a race of pale-skinned divine beings who they credited with building all of the famous Incan ancient monuments. And then the legend said that they disappeared on rafts out to sea and that they were led by a god who was called Viracocha and another name for this god was Contiki. So even in the name of mm. the expedition, there's this theory that somehow, you know, it's a bit like the Book of Mormon, isn't it? You know, the <laughs> idea that people came from the Middle East yeah. to a America and that explains everything you know it was that same idea that somehow in some mysterious way Europeans had come to South America created all of these famous monuments and then conveniently left in a fleet of rafts to go and found Polynesia okay Mm. well just leaving aside the racial undertones for a moment the fact is having the Incan sun god drawn upon the sails of a raft does look really cool Um, (laughs) which I think (laughs) is part of why He's gone down as this kind of legendary adventurer, particularly in Norway. I mean, the fact that he's Norwegian as well. The crew was four Norwegians, one Swede. They look pretty cool too. You know, blonde hair, blonde beards and sort of tanned torsos. Manning this craft made of indigenous materials with this exciting emblem emblazoned upon it. You can see why when they set off on their venture 101 days prior to this day from Peru, the public were excited by this idea. It was just after the war. People needed some entertainment. It's not often that an ethnologist makes the news. This must have seemed like an adventure. Yeah, and even though he had constructed the craft largely using both the materials and techniques that would have been available to the people who he was trying to uh, advance his hypothesis about, he did have the good sense to take with him some you know, useful modern equipment such as a radio, watches, charts, sextants and metal knives. Yeah, they played pretty fast and loose with their definition of, you know, emulating an ancient voyage. They brought water <laughs> in modern containers, but they also 
also did bring water in some of the large bamboo rods ancient travellers would have used to test if it was feasible. Uh, same kind of thing with food. You know, they brought a huge stockpile of native gourds, coconuts, sweet potatoes and basic fishing rods. But they also took tinned food and field rations from the US Army, as well as sleeping bags and sun cream. Yeah, because that's kind <laughs> of a shame when you know that because... Um, one of the iconic images of this expedition, and it's because they were filming it the whole way that we know this stuff. In fact, their footage was made into an Oscar-winning documentary in 1951, is of them sort of posing with giant fish that they've caught along the route. Mm. And the, the implication is very strongly, they've caught everything they eat. You know, there, there's no need to bring any supplies because along the way, look what they can catch. But obviously that wasn't the whole story. <laughs> but actually they were thinking, this bass is going to go great with the dauphin <laughs> potatoes we have in our ration bags. <laughs> But this wasn't a luxury trip. I mean, the fact that, as you were saying, they were bending the rules is sort of by the by. It was six men on a raft for 101 days, 4,300 miles. They couldn't have known that they would survive it. And along the way, there were storms, there were sharks, there were whales. They never met another vessel in the whole voyage. There must have been moments where they were thinking... Mm. Yeah, this did sound like a crazy idea, and that's because it's a crazy idea. <laughs> yeah, it would be three months before they saw land again after they departed from Calao, which is a Peruvian port close to Lima. They actually, again, they got a little helping hand. The Peruvian Navy towed them for the first 50 miles to avoid the coastal traffic, which obviously they were unable to steer the craft particularly, so they wouldn't have been able to avoid any of that. But after that, yeah, as you mentioned, they didn't see another vessel again. And when they finally washed up on this reef off a tiny uninhabited islet, it was a bit of an anticlimax. You know, there was no one around to greet them. In fact, they kind of just had to wander around for several days until a party of locals from a nearby island finally arrived. <laughs> they did then get taken to those locals' village and they were honoured with traditional dances and other festivities. Uh, eventually, they were transported uh, to Tahiti aboard a French schooner uh, and then the salvaged Contiki was, was sort of brought with them because really, you know, even though it had made it, it was fairly touch and go. Um, but but the funny thing is that for all of this effort, it was more a grand adventure than it was an actual bit of scientific inquiry because it was received fairly immediately and then definitely over the years that followed as being a fairly loopy and widely discredited idea that really didn't stack up once you started to dig into it too deeply. Yeah, but in terms of scientific value, you know, e even at the time, before we had genetic testing and the like, it was a privately funded expedition. And there is a reason that respectable institutions didn't want to fund it. You know, there was a lot of pseudoscience, a lot of cherry picking of evidence, you selecting things like, for instance, there were similarities between Incan boats drawn by Spanish conquistadors and crafts that were used in Polynesia. But the things that didn't support the theory, he would just disregard. And it relied a lot on anecdotes. For instance, in 1938, Heyerdahl had written his first book, Hunt for Paradise which is about he and his wife spending a year in a sparsely inhabited island in the Marquesas Islands. And in it, he speaks to an elderly local man and asks where his people originally came from. And the book says, from Tefiti, mm. the east, answered the old man and nodded towards that part of the horizon where the sun rose, the direction in which there was no other land except South America. So it was very heavily based on anecdotes. Yeah, and I think that the scientific community just wasn't ready to let this go because it was a jolly old romp and it did get lots of attention. But the ideas that it was advanced Advancing, people suspected and have subsequently practically proven were fundamentally wrong. And there was this challenge to Heyerdahl's uh, concepts in 1976, where just a rival group took a voyage on a boat that they called the Hokulea, and it tried to accurately replicate Polynesian double-hulled uh, voyaging canoes, and they used it to sail from Hawaii to Tahiti. But what they were really demonstrating was that traditional navigation mm. of of the Polynesian kind actually could work in really fundamental ways that meant that these people weren't just drifting across from South America. They were actively going out in search of places and finding them using their incredible understanding of the stars and the currents and the opportunities to use the sunrise and sunset to prove their direction and latitude. And all of that really 
immediately undercut the very thing that Heyerdahl was trying to show, and that was important for the kind of real ethnographers who had a better sense of how uh, Polynesian society had developed. And in terms of the ultimate origin of the Polynesian people, Mon scholars now believe that that initial migration came the opposite way. It came from the East Indies, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. Although there is actually some genetic evidence of South Americans on Easter Island, but that didn't occur to the medieval era, so it certainly wasn't people founding Easter Island. But it didn't slow Heyerdahl down. He kept writing, he had lots of theories. Basically, he was great at pointing to two places on the globe and going, eh. <laughs> <laughs> He had a book where he proposed that Polynesian explorers migrated to British Columbia and were the ancestors of the indigenous people there. He also believed that Scandinavians originated from Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And in 1970, he sailed from Morocco to Barbados in a papyrus reed boat following Egyptian construction. I mean, that one sounds fun. That one does sound fun. Presumably was just a jolly by that point. What was he trying to prove? (laughs) That you can also sail around other nice places eating American (laughs) army provisions. (laughs) Tomorrow. If you're trying to establish yourself as a new nation on the world stage, you cannot have the beaver pelt as your currency. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.